Mountains are topography and fire is influenced by three main elements. Four technically, I'll get into that later, but the three main elements that fire is influenced by are fuels, weather, and topography. Topography is the most constant element that influences fire behavior. And even though it's constant, it, its impact and its, its play with weather and then fire behavior, which also influences fire behavior, can make managing fire in mountainous areas really challenging. So topography in mountainous areas influences fire in several different ways. One of them is through influencing the movement of air and, the, and, and, and weather patterns. And with the way that weather, that topography influences weather patterns, it influences the way that vegetation grows. So think about if you were on a hike in an area that had some timber in, in certain spaces and some grass, and you were trying to decide whether you wanted to walk along the ridge line or whether to walk, walk along the valley bottom, you might decide to walk around along the ridge line or mid slope because the valley bottom is likely going to have more brushy material because it's got more moisture in there. So um, topography uh, influences the way that vegetation forms and it can have an accumulation of larger woody material in those um, more moist areas that allows that vegetation to grow. What that means also is that then you have more fuel accumulation in those in those valley bottom areas. Um, add to that, when you take air that is moving over a large flat surface and then you funnel it through a narrow surface, it's going to speed that air up and it's going to cause it to go faster, which of course is what drives fire behavior. Um, you might be familiar with this if you've ever done campfire building as a child and um, you realize that by just kind of blowing loosely on the fire doesn't really get you very far, but if you put your fingers together and you blow on that fire, it's gonna speed that up. The same thing happens with, um, with topography and the way that it affects that wind speed. So a couple other ways that, um, that these topographic features impact fire behavior. Um, we've got this, this thing called aspect, which is the direction of the slope and which direction, which cardinal direction that slope faces. Here in America, we're on the Northern Hemisphere, which means that the way that our Earth tilts, it is getting more direct sunlight on Southern faces. So if you happen to have a flashlight handy, or maybe even just a flashlight on your phone, or maybe pause this presentation and go and get um, a flashlight or something. And if you shine that flashlight straight down on an object, you'll see that it produces a small, but very bright ring on the ground. Um, so you can see that the intensity, the amount of um, light energy that's hitting each of those spots is, is higher. And if you tilt that flashlight, it takes the same amount of energy, nothing's changed within the light, it just takes that same amount of energy and it spreads it over um, a larger area. The same thing happens on these south facing aspects. The south facing aspect, when we have sun in the summertime that's in the south, is going to have more direct sunlight on those southern facing slopes. That means for fire behavior is that the vegetation on those south facing slopes is, tends to be drier. It also tends to be lighter fuels. So try and notice this next time you're driving around in some um, of those areas that are that mi mix of timber and grass. When you start to see, and you could predict almost where south is based on where you see trees or heavier fuel accumulation on slopes. Those tend to be on the northern sides of our, of our slopes because those are wetter, more shady. And then those southern, southern aspects are those drier, finer fuels. So now we've got topography, it's affecting the fuel accumulation. So it's both affecting the type of fuel that's there, how dry it is, what species are there, are all affected by the way topography is interacting with the way that our sun moves. So then you think about those are like some long, long, large scale things, right? These aspects are changed, are, have grown this vegetation over hundreds of years. Then you also have kind of day-to-day -day changes where you have the sunrise in the morning and it hits certain aspects. When you're talking about fire management um, on a landscape scale, you're thinking about what part of this topography is going to be available in the morning, in midday, and in the afternoon, and in the evening. So those are some of the ways that topography affects how that vegetation grows and how it affects the fire behavior. So a couple other 
pieces that come into my mind when I'm thinking about how topography impacts our fire behavior is that we have, we've got something called inversions. And an inversion is when you have a topographic feature that's kind of keeping the air from really free flowing. And this is pretty common in mountainous areas where you have your normal distribution of air goes from warm down low to cold up high because the pressure of our atmosphere pushes down on our air and it kind of keeps it down toward the surface of the earth and the air bounces around itself and it makes the air warmer. Well, at nighttime, if you've got some topography that's keeping the air from moving away, you've got cold air that kind of sneaks in underneath because it's heavier, it sinks, it sneaks in underneath that warm air and pushes the warm air up. And then you have the opposite distribution where you end up with cold air, warm air, and then it goes into the normal gradient. Well, that's called an inversion. That's important for fire because what can happen when you get into an inversion is you can have decreased fire behavior down at the bottom and then of, of the inversion and then behavior in that middle band called what we call a thermal belt. And in fire management, wildfire management, um, what we can see is, is we might expect to see decreased fire behavior at nighttime. And then what we actually end up seeing is maintained or perhaps even increased fire behavior because that inversion keeps things pretty warm. So um, topography is a pretty big deal when you're talking about, about fire. Now that's not, that's not just fire behavior, right? Like talk about fire behavior and how it's gonna impact that. But also when you're a human being and you are working on a fire that is in topography, you're not only trying to think about where the air is funneling and what kind of vegetation it's hitting, but you're also thinking about how you're going to get from point A to point B and what's the safest place to get there, safest way to get there, and how difficult is it going to be? And so working on fires in flat areas has that advantage as well. The, the disadvantage of flat areas and the advantage of areas with topography is that you have a lot more visibility generally when you have areas that are, have some, some topography to them and mountainous areas, so that you can get different angles and view different fire behavior. So fire is a part of our world. It's always been a part of our world. As long as we've had oxygen in our atmosphere and vegetation on the ground, we've had fire. And fire is fire is just rapid photosynthesis, or opposite of photosynthesis. It's, it's rapid decomposition. So you take photosynthesis, and photosynthesis is, you know, again, like going back to childhood, you got Legos, right? You're like building all of this stuff, and that's photosynthesis as you create it. And Fire is your little sister that comes and just smashes it, <laughs> breaks it all to pieces. <laughs> but it puts those pieces down, and then those pieces get to be taken back up again and built into something new. If we never had little sisters come and destroy our creations, we also wouldn't have a lot of this new development and a lot of succession as we start to build and, and have people have plants that are more adapted to the current environment, for example. So fire is that reset tool. And these systems that receive fire have been receiving fire for a very long time through various mechanisms. So what I described to you before was the fire behavior triangle. That's the fuel, weather, topography. Well, there's also this thing called the fire combustion triangle, which requires fuel, heat, and oxygen. And so we've got oxygen in the atmosphere, we've got fuel on the ground, and we need that source of heat. And that source of heat that was really the driver of fires starting, without a source of heat, you get no fires, comes from lightning and it comes from humans, primarily. Those are the two main sources. In a lot of our mountainous areas, they're high and they are recipients of lots of lightning. We also understand that our indigenous cultures that, that lived here for eons before used fire as a regular tool to produce the results that they wanted on the landscape. They wanted to produce certain food sources. They wanted to clear areas for hunting. And they wanted to uh, perhaps defend their land or protect their land. So fire and humans have, have had a relationship for a very long time. The relationship that fire and humans have had is something that we honestly, we don't know a whole lot about, partly because we started to change the behavior of the native cultures a hundred years before we started writing anything down. But we know in these mountainous areas and, in, and everywhere else that fire was a, a regular occurrence, whether it be through lightning or humans or, or other, other causes, um, natural combustion, who knows. So, Fires occurred and plants figured out a way to deal. Now they've, they've got lots of different ways to deal, plants do. And their choice on how they deal with fire is dependent on how, uh, or it determines where they put their energies as far as 
if they're going to put storage into their roots so that when a fire comes through and top kills their above ground vegetation, then they can just bust right out afterward and start to grow and take over that, that open space. Um, some plants choose to put their investment into their seeds. So for example, lodgepole pine, it doesn't invest hardly any energy into establishing a way to defend itself against fire. It establishes a way to respond and regenerate from fire. So it's a sacrificial situation where the adults are like, all right, like just make way for babies. So they're gonna just clear out all the adults and then the little babies can start to grow up and have all the resources available to them because this fire has come and just broken all the Lego pieces, all the pieces. And it now has made all of those pieces available for this next generation of, of seedlings. So part of the reason, part of the way that the lodgepole implements that strategy is it has these special kind of cones. These are called serotonous cones. And serotonous cones are cones that are held together with pitch. And they are opened up when there's enough um, temperature to open that and melt that pitch. Now the interesting thing about lodgepole pine is that not, uh, let's say 50% or so of cones of lodgepole pine are serotonous. So it's, it's not putting all of its eggs in one basket, thankfully, um, but there's circumstances that happen with a fire that make the alignment of conditions right for the development of those logical pine trees, species. So we've got serotonous cones, opens up those cones and drops the seeds. And then when you have a fire, you remove the overstory canopy because logical pines are uh, adapted for a stand replacement fire. So now there's plenty of sunlight, there's plenty of water, because there's no, in, no uh, big old trees competing for the water with you. And then you also have, again, this nutrient flush. New Jersey has really nutrient poor soils. And so really the only time that seedlings can regenerate is when you have a fire that comes and recycles those nutrients and then those, those seedlings can, can grow. So that's one strategy as well, is more of that like just total sacrifice and make, the, make way for the uh, next generation Others are investing again in that root storage. The ones that invest in root storage, a common strategy there would be to make their top end very flammable because it's a giant game of hot potato where you wanna pass that fire off from your root crown as quickly as possible. So you maybe perhaps as a, as a plant have developed more volatile chemicals in your leaves so that that fire passes over you quickly. You might see that in places like California with the chaparral ecosystems where they're meant to burn quickly so that those root crowns don't get a whole lot of heat. Um, so oak species do have a sprouting response as well. And sometimes people will think, we're gonna use fire to reduce some of these shrubby species. The reality is that fire often promotes them. <laughs> and so well, one thing that we're learning about fire ecology and fire response is that the seasonality that we burn these, these places in or these places burn makes a huge difference in our, plants, in our plant response. So a third strategy is to survive. So that would be an example of a ponderosa pine has developed strategies where it has thick bark, it has self-pruning branches so that the fire doesn't climb up above them. And then we have, and, and, and we just this open open spacing where these, these trees are meant to take up quite a lot of space, this park, kind of park-like view, right? So the needles of the ponderosa pine also have a little bit of a volatile chemical in them, mm. which allows them to burn quickly as, it, as the fire goes by and reducing the amount of heat that's, that's soaking down into the soil and impacting the roots. So, there's strategies all over the place. And I would argue that every species is adapted to fire. It might not be, we might think of adaptation as you're adapted to survive fire, but the reality is that an adaptation to die in fire and to make space for the next, next level of succession is also part of the plan. So this idea of succession is an interesting one where you start from, I think everyone can get behind the idea of primary succession, right? You got, you got, like got lava, and then you get rock or you know some dirt like smaller things right and then you get some dirt there and then after that that secondary succession is really where the magic starts to happen and that secondary succession is um really a part of what are the environmental conditions that exist on the site that make it more appropriate for one plant versus another and so you start to get you know mosses and lichens and then you got maybe some some grasses and some shrubs and then some timber and then this, this is a really cyclical process where you could have a reset back. Let's say we had a volcanic eruption back to, you know, now we're back to ground zero and back to primary succession. But more often what's happening is that you're circling back around from 
within secondary succession. And, and not even all the way back to the beginning. Um, only under extreme fire situations, if you circle all the way back to the beginning of secondary succession, most often you're circling back somewhere in the end here, where you're going from early cereal species like ponderosa pine to a later cereal species like fir. And so if we don't have the disturbance, what ends up happening is that nature take care, takes care of itself. It will have a disturbance either way. That disturbance is either gonna be beetles, it's gonna be fungus, it's going to be age, it's gonna be things like landslides. Either way, nothing in nature stays the same for very long. So this regular pattern of succession, and, and what that creates when you have succession is you have diversity. Because our world, has been in a pretty stable place for a long time, honestly, like as far as like our environmental conditions go. And with that stability that we've had over the last several thousand years, maybe tens of thousands of years, we've been able to see a lot of diversification of our species. That diversification comes because we have a diversity of our resources. So when you have a disturbance, you create a different condition in that disturbance and on the edges of those disturbances, and that caters to a different type of audience. So the um, fire is, is absolutely true for that case. W within a fire area that's been burned, there's resources that are within that spot. And then on the edges of those, you maybe have food sources now within the burned area, shelter outside of the burned area, and then a really sweet spot along those edges. So in fire, management, one thing, that we, one thing that we try to think about is this idea of fire refugia as well, which is that there's, and you, when you see a fire perimeter out there on in these maps, what you are missing is that there's a lot of gaps that didn't burn in there, and that that mixture of, of um, condition, um, both burned, unburned, but also what severity of burn it was, low, moderate, or high severity, um, those all impact the type of response that the, that the plants and animals will have to that fire. And especially as we learn to manage these areas, one thing that we have to really consider strongly is what is natural? We try and define natural as like something that existed 100 years ago. And when in reality, this, we, don't, we don't know. We don't know what natural is. And is natural natural what we think it is? Is that what we really want? Or is that what we need? Something I try and draw people's attention to is that humans are a part of our ecosystem and that we, we have an influence on, we have always had an influence on what's existed on this earth, and we will continue to have that influence. And I, 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 would, I challenge people to, to think that taking humans out of the equation might not be the answer either. And so is managing our, our forested areas specifically, or, or any rangeland, is managing it for human purposes appropriate or not? And the reality is that it, it's, it's up to you. <laughs> it's, it's, a, it's a judgment. Fire is not good or bad, fire is. Humans are not good or bad, humans just are. And what we need to consider is, do we want the results that our actions are taking? So there are no good or bad actions that we take. There are actions that we take that have results. And if we don't like those results in the ways that we're managing our natural areas, then maybe we wanna change our actions. One of the really challenging pieces of being a natural resources manager is that you are going to do more people management than you are natural resources management. And I hate to, to tell that to you because it often is bad news for people because they often get into this business because they like being alone in the woods. And um, if you want to stay at a low paying job, then you may totally remain alone in the woods. <laughs> but the reality is that if you want to impact change, then people is the way to do that. And people, Knowing, understanding the human brain a little bit and the, and the thought processes around people is really critical to making um, those impacts. And a big part of that in disturbance is that people hate it. <laughs> they hate disturbance, which I think is so funny because it's like the only thing constant is change, as you've, I'm sure you've heard. And yet we resist it like crazy. So one thing on the fire side that we like to think about for disturbance is that there's been a lot of research about the concept of how do we, how do we influence people's ability to, you know, take action. Certainly one strategy is the fear tactics. Like if you don't, you know, thin around your home, you're going to lose your home. Well, that actually, people can't hold that kind of stress for too long. In fact, they, that pushes them into inaction because to think about what they need to do on their property to make it safe for fires is so stressful that they will not do anything. So instead, an approach that we like to take with fire as a disturbance is 
this idea that you're gonna like the results when you take this action to improve your land. You're gonna like the view. You're going to um, feel more comfortable. You're going to have work with your neighbors. And I would, I would offer that same approach when you are talking about just communicating about disturbance in general is that I think that scaring people into the idea that they should like it is not going to work, but helping highlight the, the many benefits of these, of these disturbance agents is really helpful. And then also just giving voice to the idea that we don't like change. And I think that if we approach our public meetings and our public discourse with this idea that somebody should just figure it out, they should just start to like this and they should be okay with all of the, um, all of the disturbance that's happening, because like clearly it's so good. And I think, I think we're gonna lose a large portion of the audience if we do that. Instead, if we approach it that says like, yeah, you know what, I also struggle with this. This is really hard for me and I know a lot about disturbance and I can, I still have to kind of convince myself that what I'm going to see in 15 years is okay. Because even though I, if I see what, what I see now in, in one year isn't what I want, I know that down the road, either I will get to see what I'm, what I'm really going for or my grandchildren will get to see what I'm really going for here. And so just recognizing that this is a, a difficult hurdle for people's brains to jump when you're talking about the acceptance and embracing of, of disturbance. Instead, we might need to embrace the fact that we don't really like it and still find a way to, to be okay with what we are getting now.